So we have, uh, you know, three extraordinary people who, who are very thoughtful about these topics. Kishore, uh, those of you in India, you all know Kishore, Kishore Biani, who all shopped in Big Bazaar and Pantaloon and so on, so you know him well. But for those, those of you who have come from outside of India, Kishore has built one of the largest retail outlets in, in India, and he's got a new way of thinking about this whole solution. In fact, there's a new word in dictionary called the Biani way, right? So he's going to tell us the Biani way of thinking, and, and they're all bold thoughts, and how do you pursue them and make them happen? Uh, Kerry Morgridge, Kerry, I've known her uh, recently, uh, what, a year, year and a half ago, and we are working together on bringing the social innovation sandbox to US. We are already working in five cities, and we are hoping we can take it up to 300 cities in US. And Amit, Amit is a, uh, he heads the main capital. He's on Tata Sun's board, Tata Trust. He thinks a lot about, he's a systems guy, but thinks a lot about these things. But even more than that, his wife, Archana, is, is really deeply into the nonprofit sector. So every evening, their dinner conversation is a development dialogue. So, so he's fully qualified to talk about that. Uh, so, so Kishore, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got started, where you got to where you are now. I, I come from a family of uh, trader, and my grandfather shifted to Bombay, and we were textile merchants. And uh, maybe I was known as the black sheep of the family, a rebel, a contrarian, and I wanted to do something on my own. And I started supplying fabrics to the garment industry, which got me into the garment business then. Once I got into the garment business, made my first brand, some retailer didn't keep my stock, so I opened my retail business. And when we did our retail business, we saw queue outside our store. So we thought, why can't we create something which has queues outside the store always that created Big Bazaar? So I think it's been a journey of learning on the way and creating something. So we now are in food business, fashion business, and home business, and delivering it through various formats, building our own brands, building our own distribution supply chain company, and now getting into using technology, a layer above the physical, on making members in our stores, kind of a community uh, building up, collecting the data, and then data driving the entire business. So that's something, a new journey which we have started. I think India has given us the opportunity to explore multiple things. So we operate in every state of India. We have more than 2,000 stores now. We employ directly 55,000 people, one million people are dependent on livelihood from us. So it's been an interesting journey, and we are still learning. So Kishore, I understand you like your shops messy. What is that thinking all about? That used to be there earlier. Uh, I think when people came in from the bazaars to a modern retail, it, we didn't want it to be very, very uh, clean and neat aisles. And because they will get a shock, and they will not come into the store. Like, it's, it's all about having a darban outside a five-star hotel, which doesn't allow a lot of people to come in. So we didn't want that to happen because we were a mass retailer and we wanted people to come in. So we created an organized chaos in a way wherein people felt very easy and comfortable to come to our stores. So that's really co-creating the solution with the people who need it, right? So. But now things have changed. Now people don't want chaos. So our stores are much better now. <laughs> right, right, right. So, so Kerry, uh, Kerry, I've known her for a short time, but I've known her father-in-law for a very long time. You know, her father-in-law is John Morgridge, who was the first CEO of uh, Cisco Systems. And actually, he was an investor in our company 25 years ago. And Kerry is, is she is a, just a super energy person. She's done, she was, putting, she was putting all the three of us to shame because she has done three Ironman races. Nine. 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 And an Ironman race, for those of you who don't know, you have to swim 2.4 miles. You have to bike 112 miles. And then you have to run 26 miles. And you have to do all of that in how many hours? You have to do it under seven, 17 hours as a cutoff, and I did 1340. <laughs> so there is something wrong with her, because <laughs> why would somebody do this nine times, right? So Kerry, where, where, do you, where do you do all these crazy things? 
Um, I, that's where I get my motivation and my passion for life is, you know, you first have to take care of yourself before you can take care of your family. And I think a lot of us put uh, others first. And I know it sounds a little selfish, but, you know, sometimes you just have to take care of yourself. Um, as Desh said, um, my father-in-law, John Morgridge, took a company called Cisco Systems public about 25 years ago. And um, I happened to be the fortunate girl working two jobs at a bar one night when I met my husband, John Morgridge, the younger one. And from that, um, after having a couple of kids, and my daughter is here tonight in the, or today in the audience uh, with me for support, uh, after having a couple of kids, uh, my in-laws asked us if we could get involved with the foundation, and we didn't hesitate. And we made a lot of mistakes along the way when we started to up our foundation. And the mistakes were this. We kept following what other people were doing, and what we learned is that just like you are doing here, Dash is changing the conversation in this country. He's having the courage to say, let's do something different because the government's not going to take care of you the way you need to take care of yourself. Now, we're not asking all of you to run an Ironman tomorrow, but starting a business is a lot like running an Ironman. You take care of yourself and all of a sudden you're profitable. You can start to take care of your family and you can start to take care of your own community. And I think that that's at the cusp of what we do at the foundation. Um, and so we went, we grew up with our kids. At first we started literacy projects and then we went to middle school and we did high school projects and then I started worrying about dropouts. And then what happened is when my kids graduated high school, we got into workforce development. And this has really become a passion of ours. Because in, in our country, in America, only 70, only 30% are gonna get a four year degree. So what happens to the other 70% who don't get a degree? We've kind of put them off to the side. And Dash and I share the same thing, is that many, many successful small businesses and large businesses didn't have a four-year degree when they started. Now, I'm not knocking higher ed. Higher ed's fantastic if you can afford it and if you can spend the four years to go do it if you don't have to already support a family. Um, there's lots of ways to get your four-year degree, but there's also lots of ways to start a small business. And so when we, at our foundation, We've now grown to the part, part where we invest, we call our foundation investments, and we invest in transformative gifts. So just like what Jess, Desh is doing here with Sandbox, we're investing in transformation. And I'll give you a transformation project, is once we met Desh and found out what he was doing, he already had the plan laid out. He already knew exactly what cities he wanted to go into. He already knew how to scale. He had a brilliant ideas. His numbers are incredible. They empower women and immigrants in our company. 83% of the companies that he started in America are still in existence five years later. This is a huge transformative person sitting right here in front of us. So it was easy for the Mortgage Family Foundation to get behind him. But you don't always have to write a big check. And that was on the stage today. So my husband and I, um, every night, I live on a small island in Florida. And my husband and I, every night, we enjoy the beauty of the nature as we walk. But at the, at the middle of the walk, when we go to the turnaround spot, we each pull out our trash bag. And every single night, on our beach, 365 days a year, while well, when I'm living there, John and I pick up trash. If there was one thing, you don't, have, you don't have to write checks to be a philanthropist. You have to be observant of what's around you. You have to help your environment, whether that's rescuing a small dog off the street, whether that's picking up a small piece of trash. So I just want to say that we're so excited to be a partner with the Desponde Foundation because there's so many other ways to empower people today, to start today, and don't let the government tell you how to run your life. Run your own damn life. So those of you who want to read more about this thinking, Kerry has a book called Every Gift Matters. So you can get a copy of that from Flipkart or Amazon. So, so Amit, uh, talk a little bit about systems thinking and an example that that has scaled. Yeah, 
Thanks, Desh, for uh, inviting me here today. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, I think uh, my personal belief is that uh, we've generally not applied systems thinking the way we've uh, applied it in the corporate world because uh, we've seen organizations scale and deliver incredible results uh, in the corporate world, and we haven't really applied that to social sector problems. Um, and you know, my own observation, particularly now that I spend half my time in the corporate world and half my time in the social sector, is that pretty much most of the problems uh, that exist in the social sector um, are actually very solvable with the resources that we have. Uh, and you know, observing some of the uh, you know very committed philanthropists who are actually trying to solve social sector problems, um, I've seen that if you ra really bring systems thinking. Um, you can actually solve problems. Uh, and I think if you look at, for example, how Bill Gates is, has gone about eliminating polio, that's one great example uh, of how you build coalitions, uh, you know, how you go about eliminating a problem. And actually, the cost of eliminating a problem is far less than the cost of just going after alleviating it on a year-by-year -year basis. And that's a well-known example that we can talk about. And I think. Uh, again, the war against malaria is going to be another great example of that. I can tell you another uh, example, and I was seeing your slide here on farm ponds, and I'll just uh, get get to that as well. There's a great book on drought, which was written by uh, Sunita Narayan's husband, um, and you know we've actually made drought a cottage industry in this country. Uh, if you just cumulatively look at how much the you know governments, state governments, and the national government, central government have actually spent on drought relief programs, uh, both just writing checks, as well as through farm waivers, uh, through the banking system. You realize that if they would have just instead spent a fraction of that money in building farm ponds in the 70% of the country that is not irrigation, uh, you know, that doesn't have irrigation canals, uh, but is dependent on rainfall dependent, uh, 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 you know, agriculture, you realize that we would have actually not, we would have been completely drought, drought free in this country. And that's an example of system thinking. So instead, what we have is foundations like yours and mine going about trying to build you know, farm ponds and doing dam desilting, et cetera. And that's an example of system thinking. So, you know, three years ago when we started getting involved in, uh, in uh, watersheds, we realized that simply the IRR, I come from a world of finance, and so I just look at, you know, social return, the way I look at financial investments. I realized that just allocating philanthropic capital, it was the best return was actually investing it in uh, watersheds. Uh, it not just was extremely beneficial to the farmer, but it was a great return to me. And so we, we went about doing this. And then when we took it to the government, uh, we told the government that, look, this is, of course, great for us. It's great for the farmer. But this is great for you as well. Because every time we are doing this, you're actually eliminating the money that you're spending on drought relief. Fortunately, in the state of Maharashtra, we have a progressive chief minister who understands this. So we did this in uh, about 350 villages in Maharashtra in the first, in, in about three years. He looked at it and said, yeah, this actually makes sense. They constituted a committee, and they decided to do it in, 3, in 31,500 villages. So that's an example of system thinking. Congratulations. So Kishore, uh, you know, you have a, a big vision for India. So tell us a little bit about where India is heading so that everybody here can start targeting their, their outcomes to line up with that. And also, I think you have done a very good job. You know, there's a lot of business people in India where they pretty much copy what goes on elsewhere. You know, and, and you have a, uh, a lot of presence in China, Alibaba, all this stuff. How, how is India different than China, and where is it heading? I think India is probably 
a unique country to maybe around not more than 250 years ago we were 28 percent of the world trade and it was called sone ki chidiya and i think future group mission is to bring that title back to india how can we increase our trade proportion in the world and for that uh, i believe india is a very different uh, india is a very different country india is a country of seven major religion 6400 caste and subcaste we celebrate 72 major festivals 29 states and 1.3 billion people 17 percent of the world population lives in India. I'll just give you a simple statistic. If every Indian consumes 250 rupees more every month, our GDP will grow by 2%. Mm. So I come from a very different sector, wherein I believe consumption is equal to development. If you consume more, uh, our GDP will grow, we'll get into manufacturing, we'll create jobs, we'll create services, and uh, we'll become prosperous. So, and secondly, the way we, I, uh, China is a very different, China can destroy its past. India can't destroy its past. China doesn't have religion. We have, we follow a lot of religion. We are very ritualistic. And China works on a hundred year vision and we work on a five year vision. So in a sense, China and India are very different uh, societal wise. Uh, uh, China doesn't have uncles and the children don't have uncle and aunts and they don't go through their highs and lows of relationship issues. That's why they get into the gambling and the casinos and the gaming. So we have our own highs and lows through the family system in which we live. India is a much, much different country. And India, personally, when we look at China, India won't emerge at, at all like China. China is much, much more ahead in manufacturing. They have gone much, much ahead in technology. And uh, China is, is a, in a way, it's an authorita authoritarian state. Uh, the state governs everything. India is is emerging in its own way, one step forward, two step backwards, and uh, we will get there one day. So that's what India is. So India has to be understood at its own term. And I personally believe the richness of India is its culture, its heritage, and the knowledge India developed over a period of time. And how can we learn from that knowledge rather than reinvent something which is happening around the world? That's what Future Group does. We go through mythology, we have ethnographers, we have anthropologists in the organization, we have social scientists. We try to understand India at its own terms and trying to decode India. But everything in India has been written down somewhere. Our leadership model has come from uh, mythology as a group. And we believe that is everything in India can be learned from whatever has been written in the past. And we need not reinvent ourselves. And that's what we are trying to do. Yeah, you know, one big thing I've noticed is how, like I left India in 73, a long time ago, how the younger generation now values a lot of that a lot more. For example, just simple yoga, right? Yoga would have been unheard of when we were in school. But now, yoga is everywhere. All our students here, they do yoga 6 to 7 in the morning, 6 to 7 in the evening. And, and there's a lot of pride in it. And, and, and so, you know, somehow re-engaging with the old values and, and bring them back, I think. So you use them in your business? Uh, yeah, we use them in our business. We believe that ev we have we used to work. We have a chief belief officer, and we believe that every outcome result of a behavior, and every behavior is result of a belief. So, what kind of belief system one can build will result into outcomes. So our belief is India is a very unique country, and we should understand India at its own terms, and we keep on doing that. And that's what. So, and we have learned a lot from mythology, and we have adapted that in our business. Uh, uh, values, uh, our leadership model, in fact, uh, has been developed out of mythology. Very good, very good. Kerry, I want to ask you two questions. One is just to gain brownie points with my wife, because she's really into dogs, and dogs are always more important than me any day. And so I understand you did something with a puppy. So tell us what you did with a puppy yesterday. And, and also, uh, you know, you've been here for 36 hours in Hubli, you've seen a few things. What is it that you've seen that's different? So, um, Forgive me if I cry on this uh, story I'm about to share. So yesterday, we had a beautiful site visit, which I'll get to as question number two. Um, and in the afternoon, uh, we were picked up by our driver, and um, the girls went shopping, because that's what you do in India. You go shopping. Um, as we were headed into the market, which is your market, because we wanted to see all the micro businesses that had gotten launched, and we wanted to support them, um, Michelle and I, my daughter, um, is an advocate for animal rescue and volunteers two to three days a week and has two rescue dogs and two rescue cats. So animals are dear and near to our heart. So we're getting accustomed to seeing the street dogs. It's not 
great for us, but you know, Americans, I think we have a hard time adjusting to that because it, it doesn't happen in America. Um, all of our dogs have leashes and tags and so on. Um, so there was this puppy in the middle of the road and you know, our driver honked and then some motorcycles honked and one of the motorcycles blatantly ran over the puppy because it didn't move in time. And we both screamed at the top of our lungs. Now we were locked inside the car and our windows were up and our driver immediately stopped. And I rushed out of the car and I couldn't get out. I couldn't get out because um, the, it was locked. And so he let me out and I ran over. I just had a brand new beautiful Indian dress on. I was so excited to go shopping in my Indian dress. And I scooped up the puppy. Let me describe him. This puppy, its mouth was bloody, its teeth were falling out, and it, it's the stench that this poor little baby dog had that nobody should have. You can compare it to a human, you compare it to an animal. No dog should ever, ever have to live like this. So I scooped it, it was screaming, <coughs> and I picked it up, and the second I picked it up, I pulled it in as tight as I could, and I could just feel its body. Like, oh, oh my goodness, this is, this is love. I'm loved. And so my daughter was with me. She started crying. The driver, being so kind, you know, we're getting into his really expensive, fancy car, and it stinks. And there are flies following everything. And the little, his little leg was, like, all twisted up and knotted. So we get to, he doesn't, the driver doesn't know a vet. So he gets us to the market where we're supposed to be and we get out of the car and of course the women are waiting for us, your foundation people are waiting for us and they're expecting the ladies to get out and be all bouncy and hoppy. But instead I show up crying and I have this little dog who I feel is dying in my arms. I've never, ex I've never experienced anything like this. They go to work. They see my pain, they see the dog's pain and they say, we will help you. Because it takes all of us. I didn't know what to do. I'm here in a foreign country. But I knew I could do something for that dog. By the way, when I scooped it up off the street, a man looked at my daughter and he said, don't worry, just let it die. That's unacceptable. Any time, any place, any country, anywhere. That attitude has to change. So when I got to... When I got to Desha's foundation, the women went to work. They took the dog in a burlap sack, put it in the car, drove it to the vet. Michelle and I were a complete wreck. So we're trying to put on the happy face. I'm trying to wash up in the bathroom. Um, and you can't stop the emotion and you can't stop the tears because that's human nature. And we need to show more compassion on a day-to-day -day basis. So let's give Kerry a big hand for her compassion. You know, I think there's something in it for all of us to learn. So thank you, Kerry. On your second question, you said, what did I see? So let's get to the happy spot. Mm. And can I share the happy spot about the puppy? The Absolutely. puppy got three shots, and the woman who helped me is going to foster it. So if anybody's looking for a foster dog, I have a puppy. <laughs> <laughs> On the happy spot. So yesterday we had a chance to go to um, the farms and then a school. And at the farm we got to see everything that you just talked about. We got to see the mind shift of the farmer, which was the most important part for me, is to see how, I don't know how you've done it, but Desh single-handedly seems to have brought in free market to India. And I can't tell you how important this is. So the farmer who had been doing the same things the same way for all the years, again, they acted it out on the stage, Desh said, what if? And that is a question for all of you to start asking yourselves. What if? What if we could do something different? What if we could change um, how, it was, how it was done now? So this is what happened to the farmer. His what if, he said yes. He used to make 10,000 rupees a month. He now makes 400,000 rupees a month. That's his what if, and that's you. From the school, we went to a school, and I had lots of observations that I could share, but the kids all understood English. 
Dash has brought English into these uh, rural schools, which hadn't happened before. And they're not going to be able to compete globally if you can't speak English. And we're finding that more and more. So the kids were all excited to talk to us in English. My daughter, who was also a, a camp director, we sang this unbelievable song, which was so much fun. And we're going to do it this afternoon at our 3.30 session. Um, but the kids all wanted to be, when I asked them what do they want to be when they grow up, they want to be a uh, policeman, they want to be a teacher, they want to be a doctor, they want to be an engineer. Not one of those children from the small town just an hour from here wanted to be a farmer. They don't want to stay on the farms, they don't want to live that life. And education, the way Desh is teaching it, is going to help them break that poverty cycle. And lastly, I'll finish with, um, our friend here, Amitab Shab, is with Yuva Unstoppable. And the reason we're in, back in India for a second time is um, there are 130 million women who don't go to school. They're girls. Imagine what that would do to our GDP, as you just said, if more girls went to school. And in India, what we've learned is the reason that most women don't go to school is because the bathrooms weren't built for them. So women have to hold it all day long. And we've seen it in tons of towns from New Delhi, Bangalore, Jaipur. We've been in these cities where we have seen where women don't have the right to go to the bathroom. So we're here to change that. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Kerry. I know she gave me a lot of credit, but it's really... Naveen Jha has 700 people here who are actually coming up with all these new ideas. So it's really a co-creation and, and a bottom-up innovation in action. So they get a big hand. So Amit, talk to us a little bit about, we have a lot of people here who are doing fantastic work. Whether it's Tulsi doing 500, you know, half a million cataract surgeries or whatever. But a lot of the big money, uh, at least I've seen it in US, a lot of the big foundations. If, by the way, uh, Amit's brother-in-law is the dean of Harvard Business School, Nitin Noria, right? So if Nitin and his colleagues go to the foundation and say, uh, just give me $10 million, I'll, I'll do some good work on how to solve a problem. Foundations feel very comfortable giving the money. But they would not feel comfortable giving the $10 million to the people who are actually doing the work, right? So what is the missing language? What do these people have to do who are doing extraordinary work to actually go get that $10 million? Yeah, that's actually a very good question, uh, Desh. And I think there are a couple of things missing. Um, I think one thing missing is audacity of goals. Uh, and that actually you know, does uh, worry me. Uh, in the social sector, we do not have enough people who have audacious goals the way do, uh, we have audacious goals in the for-profit sector. Very few people who have uh, goals like how Tulsi of you know, Arvind has. You know, um, Whereas in the corporate world, we'll have lots of people saying we want to be, you know, we want to build a, you know, enterprise worth a billion dollars, ten billion dollars, etc. And then you'll find, you know, they'll attract talent, they'll attract capital, etc. But I don't think we have people saying I want to, you know, eliminate a problem uh, completely. So I personally feel that uh, if we have uh, some folks actually standing up and saying that we are actually going to do something in a very audacious manner, even if they don't know exactly how that's going to happen, um, I think the universe will actually conspire to align with them. Uh, so it's important in my mind for some folks to draw a line in the sand and say, we are going to you know, be audacious about uh, our aspirations. I think it begins with that, point number one. Point number two, I think uh, people need to think uh, also pretty hard about, uh, you know, how they're going to organize uh, their uh, organizations. 
You know, often um, social sector organizations are, are very lonely uh, uh, in the sense that they're built around one person. Um, and it's very tough to really go about achieving change with just, you know, one person going around doing it. You need to have a sense of organization because even in the you know for profit space if you really look at it you all, you know all of us have built companies we know that when we really go out uh, and back companies you look for an organization structure uh, you look to make sure that all the key gaps are filled in before you really you know go about uh, committing capital um, and i think that often is missing so i think leaders uh, you know, for them to really go out and, and deliver, need to think hard about attracting talent and not really thinking about doing everything themselves, point number two. I think point number three is people need to, again, think a lot about process. Um, you know, you talked about systems thinking. I think often people don't really think about how they will really think about scalability, about uh, monitoring, uh, you know, impact measurement, uh, et cetera. So there's a lot of passion, um, but there, is n there isn't enough, uh, you know, uh, there, is, there isn't enough head, there's a lot of heart into what, uh, uh, into what goes about, uh, you know, building the, uh, uh, into what goes about in terms of building the organization. And I think that's where a lot of uh, people land up faltering. So I think so those can, are can three things. So can you offer people here, let's say the top three training programs in India, that can help them build capacity within their organizations? Yeah, so I think um, what, we, you know, we realized that uh, this was a big gap. And uh, so of the four things that we do in our foundation, um, you know, one of the biggest verticals is actually capacity building. And there are four capacity building programs that we uh, sponsor. Uh, you know, uh, two are with Dasra. Uh, uh, one's called Dasra LP, Leadership Potential. The other's called Dasra AP, Accelerator Potential. Uh, they're for, you know, one is for CEOs, other is for CXOs. The third is with uh, a friend of yours and mine, uh, you know, Kash Rangan from Harvard Business School. It's run on the Ashoka uh, campus. It's for social sector leaders. It's a five-day program. Uh, and the uh, fourth program is actually, again, for exceptional social sector leaders, where we send five to ten social sector leaders to Harvard Business School every year. It's called the Mother Teresa Fellowship, which uh, we send them, um, you know, we've been using, doing that for a few years now. Uh, and they go to Boston and, and, and work with social sector leaders from all over the world. So we've got four such programs. Uh, you know, our theory of change there is that to really impact change in the social sector in India, you need at least 1,000 exceptional social sector leaders over the next five to ten years. So we are training, trying to train at least 250 every year, um, you know, start, uh, and we've been doing this now for a couple of years. Kishan, what do you do? Do you build your own capacity? Yeah, we have to do that. And uh, personally, uh, I think we have a very different approach to organization building, design. So we, we believe human being has uh, both sides of the brain, the right side and the left side, the logical side, which is the left side, and the rational side, and the creative and the aesthetic side. How can we develop human beings on both sides of the brain? And that's what is a key for having some imagination and some speed. So it's all about building entrepreneurs in the organization. So we try to operate like a startup throughout, and we do a lot of businesses in a way wherein a lot of young people can build their own ideas into business ideas and convert them into much scalable ideas. And we have done this all over all over our 30 years of existence in a way wherein we have built a lot of entrepreneurs, we have invested in a lot of entrepreneurs, mentored them, but have done it our way. I, I think management way is a very linear way of thinking. And when one thought comes in, then another thought, and it, I believe uh, in India we have to develop speed and we have to do multiple things at the same time. And management, Education doesn't allow you to do that. Is, is Biani way the Jugad way? Well, what is the difference? I think it's not a Jugad. Jugad is the wrong word. <laughs> Jugad is... Jugad what, is, what, is all, what is Jugad? A lot of people don't know what Jugad is. I think Jugad is all about... Uh, it's, it's a survival innovation. You do innovation to survive and get your end of the meal. I think that's not innovation in a way because it's survival. You can't scale it up to a level where it can be commercialized. So our way is... Uh, we have learned about holacracy, we have learned about uh, 
the system thinking, the process orientation. Not that we don't un try to understand that part of the world also. But in, in, I think doing multiple things at the same time is something unique to Future Group. Okay. I see. So Jugaad is more crisis management. You get into a crisis and find some way to get out of it. Yeah. And the other way is to actually foster a little bit more creative thinking and everything else. So, so Panaka, how much time do we have? Five minutes? OK, we've got five minutes. So why don't we take some questions from the audience? What, what questions do you have? You, you can just shout. Yeah. Uh, the question was that uh, for each one of you, if you could have coffee with someone, dead or alive, who would that be and why? You want to have coffee with somebody dead? <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK, quick answers. Quick answers. Um, for me, it would definitely be with Charles Koch. Um, Charles Koch, uh, Koch Industries in America has done amazing things for the free market. Just in the last five years, he's grown his net worth from about $10 billion to $85 billion because he's investing in the future of our country. And how he's doing that is by supporting small businesses and giving microloans and working on policy. We've got to work on policy. And I want to understand policy and what you're talking about on scale goes hand in hand. So Charles Koch is absolutely brilliant. Love the man. I would have loved to have uh, tea with Sam Walton, not coffee, but uh, <laughs> I think uh, we have read up uh, about retail, the, the frugalness, and I would, uh, I've been to their offices and the way they operate. I think it's so much to learn. So how it originated, how it started, and how they could maintain that culture and still, I think the ghost of Sam Walton still survives in Arkansas in their offices. So I want to understand how they've made it uh, happen and it exists till today. So what, what was your tea like with Jack Ma? I didn't meet Jack Ma. So I was a guest at their 11-11 function, and I didn't meet him personally, but I was there when it was happening. But I saw a lot of things happening of Alibaba and the new, new retail which they have built. So Amit? Yeah, so, um, so my entire philanthropy uh, or philosophy in life has been influenced by three people. Um, you know, Bill Gates, fortunately, I've got, got to spend enough time with him now. Uh, Chuck Feeney, uh, who again, I was, I had the opportunity to, I was invited to have tea with, coffee with him uh, last summer. So I got, uh, that got fulfilled. And the third was uh, uh, Guru Nanak, who lived 500 years ago. So if it's, if I had an opportunity to spend, uh, you know, coffee, <laughs> coffee with him, it would be him. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I feel all of you are a gift to humanity, particularly to India. We need you. Uh, in the ocean, we get uh, three times more solar energy than in the land, just because it is three times more area. And it retains most of the energy, unlike land, which radiates back. So it's virtually nearly ten times more. And the most of the energy there gets converted, ready to consume protein in the form of fish, it gets recycled and gets lost. And eventually, after million years, if you survive, it may come as a petrol or gas, but not for today. But there is a way to extract it. Only thing is we sink because there is no primary invention taken place in the ocean because we are afraid of it. We can do something. I think all big giants like you should apply little mind on that. And I also can share with you as and when okay. time comes. Great. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you. That's a great innovation, but I don't know if any of you are qualified to talk about that. So. You know, the good thing about a lot of these people is they don't talk about things they don't understand. So. Yes? You said about the talent acquisition in NGOs or social entrepreneur model uh, should be where uh, you're not applying your heart alone and you're applying your mind. But a lot of... Huh? As well. As well. So a lot of times what we see is that uh, in a social setup, in a social organization setup, uh, we are not able to pay people uh, uh, equal to a corporate. So a lot of challenge is that uh, only people uh, who have passion, that is heart, uh, you know, tend to join the organizations. And this is where the challenge comes in, uh, wherein, you know, you're not uh, thinking only, uh, you're thinking only from the heart and uh, very less from the mind. Because uh, it's just a passion which is from the heart. Right. 
So, so how do you how do you build those organizations? Yeah, I, I would I would uh, challenge the notion that people who uh, think from their heart don't think from their head. Uh, my own uh, experience, I've worked closely with Venkat Krishnan, who built uh, Give India and uh, uh, built, you know, Dan uh, as a movement. I can bet you that any corporate would not be able to hire him for any amount of money. Uh, I've worked with Shaheen Mistri, who's built Akanksha and Teach for India. I can bet you that no one would be able to hire her in the corporate world for any amount of money. I've, you know, my wife uh, runs uh, one of the largest, uh, uh, the, the, the largest NGO uh, working in the field of mental disabilities. 40% of our workforce, senior workforce, is volunteers. It includes uh, retired CEOs of large organizations who, you know, and these are people who want to work there because it's a purpose-driven organization. I think, uh, you know, I would challenge this notion that, uh, you know, you can only hire people uh, because, you know, they are passionate and they are not smart. I think you have to show them a sense of purpose, and you'll attract the right people. Uh, it's important to show people that they can actually, that there's, some, there's something higher uh, that can be achieved, and uh, you will actually attract the right people. That's been my experience across the board with a lot of the people that I work with in the organizations that, uh, that I support and I'm involved with. You know, actually, it's not really that different in the for-profit sector. Most of the companies, they get started, and they never scale beyond a mil, five mil, 10 mil. And that's primarily because the founders are control freaks. You know, to start anything new is true. You have to be slightly crazy. But the slightly crazy people who also embrace a little bit more of an organizational structure, a little bit more of delegation and systems thinking and so on, can build large things. So Kishore is slightly crazy, but he's been able to think broadly in terms of scaling that whole thing. So because when you start something new, you know, I think the nonprofit sector came from social worker side, right? A social worker is somebody who has a huge amount of compassion, but they look after one, two, three, four, five people, and they do anything they possibly need to do to help those people. And to that, we are slowly beginning to add a little bit more of the system thinking. But like Amit says, there's a lot of people who can do both, and, and that's what we need. Uh, can you comment on the difference between the way uh, people operate in an organization in India versus anywhere else in the world in terms of what drives individuals in our culture? Is it uh, the social status? Is it belongingness? And how does that impact organizational behavior? I believe uh, everybody needs a, firstly you need a common purpose and a vision. So as a leader, uh, we have to create the promised land. So that's, that's part of mythology. So then and the promised land is never achieved, but still you create a promised land. So that's the first thing which we do. Second thing is uh, Indians have more emotions than anybody else in the world. So we have to manage the emotion. Secondly, Indians have families to deal with. And that's something very unique to India. And uh, that again, in, in that sense, we are quite different. Fourthly, we, are, we have a macro environment which we have to tackle. The amount of regulations which we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis is quite different. The level playing fields are different. The rules of the game get changed in between. Uh, India, in, in a sense, is quite a unique uh, country, which is emerging at a, in a different era at a different time. And I think that's the change which we as a leader have to navigate and build the team to deal with managing at the speed of change. Keep on changing. I think we were discussing with Amit, uh, India, you can't survive with one thought for a long period of time. You have to keep on reinventing ourselves. So we, are, we get reborn again after every three to five years. So it's the belief in rebirth. <laughs> every five years in the same life. Uh, yes. Good morning, sir. Uh, sir, my question is to all of you all. Uh, sir, when you enter a certain new geography with a certain idea, or like he says, a crazy idea, there's a certain apprehension in accepting your idea. So what are the few lessons that we could learn from your journey? Um, so, Kishore, why didn't you give up? I think it's, uh, 
I think any idea, it's a belief you have in the idea. And once you believe in something, you go for it. And uh, I always believe that any idea you have, the plan A on which you have built the idea will never work. It is the plan B which is going to work or maybe the plan C. Except in a particular business which is cinema, wherein uh, you release a film on Friday, it gets decided whether it will work or not. In rest of the chance, you have a chance to change it. So whatever you believe in, I think if you have conviction about it, I think there are good chances you will be successful. I'd like to comment on that too. Um, we invest in a lot of uh, startup nonprofits. Um, so it's very similar to what they're doing, just on a flip side, because there are you know, thousands, if not hundreds of thousands in America that are not, uh, NGOs. And you have to learn how to fail and pivot and fail again, and keep iterating your idea until it's perfect. So right now we're working with a uh, project uh, at MindSpark Learning, and we invented um, with the CEO, it's called the Education Accelerator. Well, no one's ever heard of an Education Accelerator. It's kind of like when this first came out. Remember we had a flip phone before this and it didn't have a touch screen? And how did Steve Jobs convey to the world, we're gonna change the world by a touch screen. Oh, and by the way, I'm gonna disrupt the uh, music industry and, and then I'm gonna disrupt the watch industry. So you have to iterate, fail, iterate again. You probably are onto a good idea if one of us are investing in you, but don't think that that's a home run idea. Allow yourself to continue, it's called continuous improvement, call it what you want. But um, to get to the end goal, where we started 10 years ago as a foundation isn't even close to where we are today. So one of the things I also see is that uh, foundations like ours will get stuck because they keep giving the same programs to the same nonprofits, but they expect different results. And that can't be. So um, fail, pivot, and fail again. Yeah, I would say ideas are massively overrated. Um, and my experience has been that uh, it's actually perseverance and execution uh, that really carries you through life. And uh, if there's something that I've learned, it's actually that failure is normally your best friend. You learn a lot more from failure that, than you learn from your success. So I think I'm getting signals that we're running over time. I know a lot of you have a lot of questions. So what you should do is send your questions to the foundation, somebody in the foundation, and we will make sure that they, are you making commitments to answer all the questions? So you have a commitment here. So you will get answers for your questions. So, so just send the questions to the foundation. So thank you very much. Let's give them a big hand.